I think many people are surprised to learn that there are now ticks able to survive in the north. I'm Emily Chenry, PhD student at University of Toronto, where I'm researching the spread and impacts of the winter tick parasite in Yukon. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my second field season, which has just finished. Winter ticks are blood feeding parasites that likely arrived on elk translocated from Alberta in the 90s. They live for one year and feed on a single big deer host for most of their life. Now, although they don't spread diseases, when present in large numbers, they can cause severe hair loss, blood loss, and even death in their host. In 2018, I found some locations where the off-host larval life stage of the winter tick was surviving, so I used this information to try and decipher where they could be this year. Actually getting a detection at all was a bit of a needle in a haystack scenario. Yukon is a very large place and larvae are just the size of a grain of sand. Um, so this year I really focused on places that we'd found them before in order to maximise the number of detections we could get. This meant focusing all of my sampling efforts on Ibex Valley, where I found larval winter ticks in four areas in 2018. We repeatedly sampled 15 sites in total from August to the end of November, finding larval ticks at 10 of those sites. Last year, we had a problem even finding these larvae, and this year, I'm having a problem collecting them all up. There's so many. And I really don't think it's just that we uh, have more this year, I think it's just that we know where to look. By collecting data on tick presence over the season that included habitat and environmental information, I hope we can create a map of suitable winter tick sites for Yukon both now and under future climate scenarios. As you can imagine, larval ticks are not the easiest to work with. Sometimes the data try and enter themselves on the spreadsheet. There's one larval tick. Oh, look at that. Look at that. It's like a modern art piece. <laughs> see what we can get. Woo! <laughs> Don't get me in the face! Okay, let's get the flag out of the control. Of course, the off-host life stage of the winter tick is only one piece of the puzzle. To understand which potential host species are most at risk, we need to really see who's using which habitat at key times in the winter tick year. To complement last year's camera study, as well as this year's larval flagging, I've established 70 wildlife trail cameras throughout Ibex Valley. And the hope is that we'll be able to understand a bit more about which host species or potential host species could be using areas that have winter ticks active. Field work can be really intense. It's often physically and mentally demanding and I'm away for about three months at a time in which I'm thinking about nothing else but finding ticks or tick hosts. Um, but I'm so lucky to have a network of people who provide me with invaluable support over this period. A big thanks especially to Wildlife Conservation Society Canada and the W. Garfield Western Foundation for supporting me financially again this year. Funding like this is really important, not just for purchasing equipment, but by increasing the amount of time I can spend in the field, it really helps to build connections. For example, ongoing engagement with the hunting community this year has seen us increase the number of moose hides submitted to the government for winter tick checks by over 50 times in a single year. From a personal point of view, it's also really given me the confidence to take charge of my research and I think that's critical in my development as a conservationist. I think in all, the changing climate definitely brings many future challenges for Yukon and its wildlife, um, the ticks being just one right now. But I am very hopeful that with ongoing engagement, we'll be able to protect what we have now and for the future.